Now that we've thought about the rate of molecular evolution, let's go back and think about what sorts of DNA or protein changes can occur. So these alleles, capital A, lowercase a, capital B, lowercase b. Let's look at a couple of individuals here, right, this sequence here, and if this individual is the same, but at this site they have an adenine instead of a thymine, adenine is a purine and thymine is a pyrimidine, so this difference, or this mutation in this individual, this is termed a transversion. So a transversion is any mutation from a purine to a pyrimidine or the converse. And that's distinguished from here, this individual having a thymine as a new mutation instead of the cytosine, that's a change from one pyrimidine to the other. Changes from a purine to a purine or a pyrimidine to a pyrimidine, these are called transitions. So in general, chemically, transitions will be more likely to happen per generation and like within cells than transversions, if you just think about the chemistry that would have to be involved. We actually tend to see higher rates of transitions than transversions. One easy way to kind of keep track of which ones are the pyrimidines and which ones are the purines is the word pyrimidine has MD in it, like a doctor, and what do doctors do? They cut people, so C, the uracil, and then thymine. So you're welcome for that mnemonic. So those are transitions and transversions, which are the nucleotide changes. The next thing to think about is how do these nucleotide changes influence the function of a protein or the fitness of the organism? So some changes are termed silent or synonymous changes. So here I've illustrated a set of 15 nucleotides, five codons, coding for these amino acids. If this adenine is changed to a guanine, so that there's that particular transition that occurs, the CAG codon here still codes for valine, just as the CAA codon did. So this individual, even though they're a mutant, they have a mutation, they're still making the same amino acid, they're still making the same protein, there's no change in the protein, so we would think this is almost always neutral, so we turn it silent, because it's not really changing the fitness, or synonymous, because this word here means the same thing as this word here. They're like synonyms. In contrast, replacement or non-synonymous mutations, or substitutions, are ones that do change the amino acid. So here, if the cytosine changed to a thymine, right, that transition occurred. Now, this codon codes for isoleucine instead of valine. This protein is now different, and this would often be deleterious, sometimes beneficial, sometimes neutral. The exact ratios of deleterious to neutral to beneficial, as we alluded to in the previous lecture, are under debate. But when you have a change that changes the amino acid, we term this replacement or non-synonymous, right? This is not a synonym for this because they have a different meaning. There are also mutations termed nonsense. So here we have these five codons. If you have a mutation here, this adenine changing to a thymine, ACT no longer codes for cysteine or in fact any amino acid. That's one of the, the three stop codons. So during translation, as the cell machinery is scanning through these nucleotides, instead of continuing to produce a protein, it would actually stop right there. So your protein, however long it was here, would be truncated right there. The protein would be a lot smaller, and so this would almost always be deleterious. That's why we term it nonsense, because it kind of doesn't make any sense, right? You've totally changed the protein and almost certainly gotten a non-functional one. There are always exceptions. There are some cases where nonsense substitutions seem to have resulted in functional proteins, but almost always this is going to be deleterious. A fourth type of genetic mutation is an insertion or deletion event, often called an indel, because if we're just comparing two species, we often can't tell whether there was an insertion or a deletion. So the way this works is we've got our 15 nucleotides, and then right here between the guanine and adenine, if there's an inserted thymine, that kind of shifts these nucleotides over, this codon, instead of being ACA, is shifted over the A, the C, and then the A is now in the next codon. TAC is a brand new codon, essentially, and so the protein goes from being valine, alanine, glycine, cysteine, serine, to valine, alanine, glycine, methionine, phenylalanine, etc. And in fact, the rest of these are basically all randomized. By shifting these nucleotides over, you're essentially randomizing the remaining amino acids because these codons are all now completely different. This is called a frame shift. The reading frame has been shifted by one nucleotide. 
And this will almost always be deleterious because the amino acids that had been there doing whatever functions they are, they're now all randomly changed to new ones. You would definitely expect this to almost always be bad for the protein. And again, with indels, we often don't know whether they are insertions or deletions unless we have more than two taxa. Another type of mutation that occurs in the genome arises from things called microsatellites. Microsatellites are short, repeated DNA sequences. So imagine we're looking at this individual here. They are a homozygote, and they have five of these AT repeats. And we're gonna focus on how many repeats they have in this region. If you had an unequal recombination event, and now let's track this cytosine is on this chromosome, this adenine is here, during recombination, if you have an unequal recombination event, you can in fact cause the five and five to become four and six. So for example, you have a break like right, right there, you could now get a brand new allele and a second brand new allele just from recombination. And because these sequences are very repetitive, they often line up wrong during recombination. And so this mutation rate from being a homozygote with an allele we can consider to be five repeats to being a heterozygote now with a four repeat allele and a six repeat allele, that actually turns out to be very, very common, much more common than, say, transitions or transversions. And so this is actually why microsatellites are appropriate for closely related species or individuals. This mutation rate is so high that there are lots of genetic variants produced. This is the exact sort of data that's used in crime scene investigations, right? So here's kind of a, a gel. There have been seven victims. They have genetic data from these seven victims. These two bands are corresponding to different sized repeats. And then you bring in the three suspects, and this suspect has a pair of alleles that don't match. This suspect has a pair of alleles that don't match. So you can send suspect one and three home. This individual has a pair of alleles that match those of the perpetrator. This doesn't prove it's him, right? Because lots of other people would have that same pair of alleles, but certainly warrants more investigation of this person, less investigation of these two people. Microsatellites are used for these sorts of analyses because they have this really high mutation rate that leads to lots of variation. However, they are not appropriate for very divergent species or groups because if you have lots of time, the mutations will occur so quickly and be so numerous that you have lots of uh, reversals, convergences, homoplasy, and any pattern in your data will be totally scrambled. So transitions and transversions and those sorts of substitutions are often useful for making phylogenetic trees. Microsatellites are often not useful for making phylogenetic trees because the timescales are too long. At this point, I'd like to clarify three terms that are often poorly used and often used kind of interchangeably with each other, and they do in fact represent completely different things, and it's very important to keep them straight. So the word mutation refers to the change in a single individual. An individual receives a mutation to their genome. A polymorphism is when a mutation is observed at a certain frequency. So a few generations later, the individual that had the mutation has now reproduced. There are multiple offspring that carry copies of that mutation. That population now has a polymorphism for that allele. And then a substitution is when an entire population changes because of a fixation of what started off as a mutation. For wild type alleles and populations to change over time, there has to be a mutation in a single individual that then becomes a polymorphism of the population, and then when it fixes, that is now a substitution. And I point this out because many people use these terms kind of interchangeably and without being very precise about their language. We should not use the term mutation if we're thinking about a population before and after a change where all the individuals have now changed, right? Because that actually causes us to have a misconception that all the individuals have mutated together or something. Mutations happen in individuals. If they increase in frequency, they become polymorphisms. If the allele fixes and now everybody has a copy of that new allele, we say that that allele has become a substitution. So what influences rates of substitution? Right, these actual rates that we were looking at in the previous video, in fact. Well, first of all, the mutation rate was a big part of this. So microsatellite repeat number change would be very fast because the mutation rate is very high. 
nucleotide substitutions, transitions would have faster rates of substitution than transversions because their mutation rate is higher. Nucleotide changes that affect amino acids, we would expect them to be fixed or substitute slower than ones that don't because they'll more often be deleterious and selected against. So even though the mutations will occur just as often, the substitutions would be less frequent. Junk DNA or intergenic sequences change faster than coding regions because mutations in there are more likely to be neutral and therefore can fix by drift as opposed to being deleterious and prevented from fixing due to selection. Introns, um, we see changing faster than exons. The rate of substitution in introns is higher than the rate of substitution in exons for the exact same reason as we see it for intergenic distances. Third positions in codons substitute faster than the second or the first positions because these more often result in silent mutations which can become silent substitutions. And in general, silent and synonymous, remember these are the ones where the amino acid does not change, silent or synonymous substitutions will be faster than replacement or non-synonymous substitutions. When we look at amino acid substitutions, where the amino acid is changed, right, so non-synonymous nucleotide substitutions result in amino acid substitutions. Uh, these will be more rare than nucleotide substitutions, right, the non-synonymous rate is lower than the synonymous rate. And in fact, some of these may be more or less like than others. We can think about starting from this codon, mutation here would cause a change in an amino acid from hydrophobic isoleucine to hydrophobic leucine. They're about the same size, they have about the same chemical properties. You would expect the protein to be not changed that much. We term this a conservative substitution when there's little change in the charge or size of the amino acid. In contrast, starting from this same codon, if you have a mutation in the second position to the cytosine here, now the hydrophobic isoleucine would be replaced with a hydrophilic arginine, which is also larger. That's gonna have a much bigger effect on the protein that that mutation or substitution occurs in. And we term this a radical substitution when there's a large change in the charge or the size of an amino acid and we would totally expect conservative substitutions to occur much more frequently than radical substitutions because although the mutations that are conservative or the mutations that are radical probably happen at roughly equal amounts, selection against these will probably not be as strong as selection against these, which will result in higher substitution rates for conservative rather than radical. And then finally, all genes are equal, but some genes are more equal than others. There's differences in the functional importance of genes. So observations when we compare sequences have shown that the fastest evolving genes are the ones that have many copies that do similar tasks, so redundant genes. So where selection on one of those copies is maybe not as strong as for situations in which the gene only has a single locus that's doing a function. If you have lots of different copies that are all very similar, a mutation in one of those is unlikely to be selected against um, that strongly. So for example, olfactory receptor genes, we have lots of different genes that allow us to smell lots of different things, or the major histocompatibility complex genes, right, lots of different loci that result in the production of different types of antibodies. Lots of different copies, all very similar, and then we actually see higher rates of substitution in these loci than we do in lots of other loci that only have single copies. So these, this redundancy may make some genes less deleterious when they're changed, or if we think about how these things actually influence fitness, sometimes change may be favored just to increase diversity, right? Being able to smell more things, being able to bind to more antigens. And the slowest changing genes, when we look at substitutions, are fundamentally important ones like histones. If you think about histones, those proteins are what the chromosomes kind of wrap around, and a change at a histone protein would influence the structure and stability of all the DNA in every single nucleus and every single cell, and that's a huge effect on an organism. So we would expect virtually every single amino acid mutation, even maybe minor ones, to be deleterious because the DNA is physically in contact with a large proportion of that protein. And in fact, we see very, very low rates of substitution for histones versus very high rates of substitution for olfactory receptor genes. So when we think about the rates of molecular evolution, 
we have a continuum from microsatellite repeat numbers, which change very, very quickly, even between individuals in generations, all the way to different types of genes where redundant genes change faster than unique or important genes, and these things may go unchanged for tens or hundreds of millions of years, and then a whole continuum in between. And so which one of these you use to study the evolutionary process depends on the time scale you're interested in. If you're interested in variation within a population in just a few generations, this is appropriate. If you're interested in making phylogenies for closely related species, these are appropriate. Phylogenies for more distantly related species, in order to reduce the amount of homoplasy, these then become more appropriate. So when we're doing molecular evolution and pursuing this work, there are a lot of different factors to keep in mind that will guide us towards using the appropriate type of data to answer the question that we have.